Chris and I were commissioned to build a large L-shaped desk. So naturally with any large project like this, we decided to divide and conquer. I would take the lower section of the desk, cabinet legs, privacy panels, and since Chris has been doing a lot of slab work lately, he would take care of the large two slab top. Obviously, a huge desk requires a huge amount of material, and organizing and prepping this material is one of the more time-consuming parts of a build, especially when working with all solid wood. And all of this is going to be turned into the two walnut cabinets, so I could have used plywood for a lot of this stuff, which certainly could have sped things up, but we're making this one out of all solid wood because solid wood looks cool and cool looking desks are good. Lumber often comes to us in some level of roughness. It usually doesn't have straight edges or flat faces. So the basic idea is that I'm taking crooked, kind of messed up boards and making them as straight and flat as I can, which then makes them easier to turn into panels which turn into cabinets, which turn into desks. And that's just how it works. And yes, you can actually purchase pre-milled lumber. And honestly, going through the entire milling process yourself won't really save you time or money. I mean, actually, it'll cost you time and money, which makes it a bad business decision. But because I'm a woodworker and not a businessman, I choose to spend all my time and money doing it this way because I now have full control over the quality of lumber that I'm gonna be using. I know that I'm gonna get a better finished product compared to if I was relying on the lumber yard to mill all of the boards. Now, I'm not saying they do a bad job, but the only person that knows exactly what I need for the quality of furniture that I wanna build is me. And starting with the best possible material I can will make the rest of the build go that much more smoothly. It'd be like if instead of paint, you gave Picasso some stuff like mud and guacamole and told him to go paint. He'd probably be like, hey, I'm Picasso. Why'd you give me mud and guacamole to paint with? And he'd probably still end up making some pretty good art, but it probably would have been a lot more difficult and it would probably taste terrible. So proper milling yields nice material and nice material yields even nicer panels and boxes. Just like how having nice paint yields a nice painting, if you're Picasso. By the way, if you want to get really into the weeds about making perfect panels, Chris and I have done a few videos over the years about that exact subject, so I'll link to those in the description. Now, besides dividing and conquering the build, we also have divided and conquered the videos. I made a video for the stuff I'm building, and it's on this channel, and Chris made a video for the slab top and put it on the Four Eyes channel. And we did this for a couple reasons, none of which are overly dramatic. Sorry if I tricked you with the uh, juicy details teaser a minute ago. But it started with the possibility that my family and I would be moving to a different area in the near or somewhat near future because of a job change for my wife, which would make working out of the same shop and building projects and videos together pretty difficult. I know we've all gotten used to doing Zoom meetings over the past few years, but Zoom woodworking just doesn't make as much sense. So from a purely logistical standpoint, we figured having two channels gave us a little more geographical flexibility. We've also made a conscious effort to make more thoughtful and refined videos and pieces of furniture lately, kind of a quality over quantity approach, which is better for us and we can deliver a better product to you. It's a win-win. So. Being able to deliver quality content across two channels seems even better than that. A win-win-win. And nothing is really changing for the other parts of our business like our online courses. And honestly, for the time being, we're still working out of the same shop and we're still gonna work on projects together when it makes sense. So besides getting an extra video from us every month or so, not much is changing. How's that for drama? Making a mitered box is one of those rite of passage type things that you learn along the way when learning woodworking. I've made many mitered boxes and they've become, I guess, fairly routine for me. But if you ever feel like you're getting a little complacent or too comfortable with something, just make a small change. Like instead of making a box with 90 degree corners, 
make a parallelogram with 80 and 100 degree corners. Sometimes those small changes can end up feeling pretty significant and can be enough to get you thinking in a new way. I've been making mitered cabinets for years, but looking at the geometry in a different way keeps me on my toes. Just like how making a woodworking video isn't really anything new to me, but posting it on my old channel is definitely keeping me on my toes. I wrote this very part at 1.45 in the morning because I couldn't sleep worrying about whether or not this is gonna be a fun video for people to watch. Luckily, I've got geometry on my side and things are never quite as complicated as they seem. Supplementary angles make building a parallelogram box just about as simple as a regular box and the circle of people that have supported me over the years during my woodworking journey are hopefully still here for this next chapter, which really makes this all feel a little less daunting. Geometry, man, it's magic. No matter how organized you are and how far ahead you plan, there's almost always gonna be a time where you have to improvise and come up with a solution. When making boxes, I always try to plan ahead and cut edge details in before gluing up the box. Either aesthetic details like the front chamfer or structural things like a rabbit for the back panel, which I did for these cabinets. But sure enough, after gluing the boxes up, I made a slight design change and needed to cut a deeper rabbit to accept a thicker back panel on the upper third of each cabinet. Adapting to change. I just might end up being pretty good at that by the end of this video. Did you know that you can get wood delivered to you in a cardboard box? I couldn't really believe it either, especially six foot long boards of eight quarter red oak. But sure enough, a place called Woodworker Source will straight up mail you lumber. I used to have my shop in a place where it was probably a two hour plus round trip for me to buy lumber. And if I ever made the trip and forgot to buy something or didn't buy enough, I was out of luck. One time I drove up to the lumber supplier on a Saturday, not knowing they were closed on Saturdays, only to find out they were closed on Saturdays. It was a nice drive though, not, uh, not a total waste of time. I don't have a two hour drive to the lumber yard anymore, but when Woodworker Source got in touch with us and asked if we wanted to try out some mail order lumber, we said, yeah, of course. And sure enough, lumber showed up in cardboard boxes at our shop. And lucky for me, it was exactly the type of lumber I needed to make the legs for this desk. Some beefy red oak, since this is what was going to be holding up this beefy desk. Remember the time consuming, but wildly important process of milling my own lumber that we went through a few minutes ago? Well, lucky for me, it was time to do it again to start making the panels for the legs, and lucky for you, I filmed every step of it, again. And even luckier for you, we have the power of movie magic at our fingertips, so to spare you the boredom of watching it all over again, let's just fast forward. Now, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but if you mill everything really nicely and properly, you can get perfect panel glue ups without the need for dominoes or biscuits. Sometimes it's easy to forget the most obvious things. And I usually forget stuff when I feel like I'm the most organized and confident in what I'm doing. But forgetting about one of the three legs for this desk? Really, Sean? But yes, I did forget about the center leg when divvying up all the red oak I had for the base. As soon as I had my plan for milling and gluing up the two big leg panels, I was kind of cruising on autopilot, not really a care in the world. Then all of a sudden I have an aha moment, or maybe in this case it was a uh, oh shit moment. And I realized I wasn't gonna have enough wood for the center leg. Well, luckily I prescribed to the always keep your offcuts mentality because sure enough, the offcuts from the two large leg panels ended up being the perfect size for the two halves of my center leg. I wish I could say this was my plan all along because then I would look smart and good at what I'm doing, but unfortunately, it really wasn't my plan all along, so I guess I'm not as smart or as good at what I'm doing as it might seem. Also, if you've ever considered keeping double-sided tape in the shop, I'm here to spread the good word. Keep double-sided tape in your shop. I needed to figure out how to cut the 45 degree bevels onto the edge of my center leg halves, and since they had already had an angle cut onto one edge, 
it would be tricky. A sled was out of the question, as you can see, so I realized if I stick them together, I get a rectangle, and I can just rip the edges like any other board. And I stuck them together with double-sided tape. And this might be my unpopular opinion of the day, but stop messing around with the painter's tape and CA glue thing. Just use double-sided tape, it's so much easier. So this actually isn't the first time I've made a parallelogram cabinet for a desk. We made a slab desk a couple months ago and it had a similarly shaped cabinet with three drawers. And one of the comments we got from a handful of people was that they were disappointed that I didn't make the drawers parallelograms as well. Instead, what I do is make small spacer blocks for the drawer slides to attach that compensate for the angle of the cabinet. And really the main reason for this is it's the easiest way to make it all work with the drawer slides that we use. Sure, I could have made my own wooden slides and made the parallelogram drawer boxes, but then I wouldn't get this sweet action. Also, who the heck wants a parallelogram drawer box? Can you imagine how much crud and junk would get stuck in that bottom acute corner of the drawer over time? It's like a paperclip black hole. A rubber band Bermuda Triangle. I don't know about you, but I would take that smooth soft close action over that all day. One of the nice things about building and filming a piece of furniture that has a lot of identical parts is that I get multiple chances to get it right. I tend to kind of figure it out on the first one, then I can just knock out the rest of them. It also gives me multiple opportunities to film something, or I guess the more likely scenario is, again, I figure it out on the first one, so then when the camera's rolling on the second one, I look like I know what I'm doing. Or more accurately, I'm not having to figure things out while the camera is on, because if you've ever filmed yourself doing something, you know that camera adds a little bit of anxiety. It's like trying to land a kickflip on tape when you were a kid. All that being said, there's no more repetitive task than building drawer boxes. A bunch of small plywood rectangles that are then put back together into just boring looking boxes. And then trying to explain it in an interesting way just feels downright dishonest because it really just isn't that interesting. In the past, we've often used the drawer box section of a video to throw to a sponsor or an ad read, but luckily for you, and I guess not really luckily for me, there's no sponsor today. And for the most part, my old channel never really had the typical YouTube sponsorships, which was always kind of nice from a video standpoint, but not nice from a money-making standpoint. Now, I'm not saying I'll never do an ad in one of my videos, but maybe for now I can sponsor my own video instead. So I want to thank Sean for sponsoring today's video. Hey, you're welcome, man. If you're interested in woodworking, and especially if you're interested in learning woodworking, go check out our video project courses. Over the past few years, we've put together what we think are some of the best online woodworking courses out there. Each course will guide you through the entire process of building a piece of furniture and hopefully leave you with plenty of new skills and techniques that you can then apply to your own designs. So go check out our website, see if any of the designs speak to you, and give it a try if you're wanting to improve your woodworking. All right, thanks, Sean. Let's get back to the video. Let's talk about one of my favorite cabinet making tips, and it's a tip I'm pretty sure I haven't mentioned in a previous video, and it has to do with spacing drawer fronts, and it's so simple and effective, you're barely gonna believe it. But first, what a surprise, I have to make some more panels. I'll spare you the milling footage for this section and we'll just hop straight to the glue up, where my keen-eyed viewers might notice that I'm not using dominoes in the panel glue up, and that's because this panel is gonna be cut up into three separate drawer fronts, and I don't want to risk exposing a domino when I do that because that would end up being an ugly detail and the client actually did not request ugly details in this desk. So a domino-less panel cut with matching angles to the cabinet so that the full panel fits perfectly into the cabinet opening. No gaps at this point, like a frickin' glove. Now, usually we wanna have small gaps around the drawer fronts, so the drawers slide in and out, no problemo. Maybe a 16th of an inch or so around each one. And instead of getting ourselves all confused and messed up with the exact measurements, we once again have math on our side. 
because we're making three drawer fronts, I know that when I make the two cuts here and here with my eighth inch thick saw blade, those two eighth inch wide gaps will then be spread across the four gaps that I need and will mean that each one is a 16th of an inch. Now to be fair, this only really works when you have three drawers in a cabinet, but many of the desks I've made over the years have had three drawers, so I would say I'm being pretty dang fair. We went with store-bought drawer pulls for this one, and I kind of have three requirements for going with store-bought over making my own when it comes to parts in my furniture. Is it easier, cheaper, and better than what I could make? If all three are a yes, I buy. And I'll be honest, it's almost always easier to buy. It's fairly often cheaper, but most of the time, it's better when I do it myself. In this case though, it hit the magic trifecta, and we decided to buy some nice brass pulls. I always like to hear everyone's thoughts on different things in my videos, and it's always interesting when we can get some good discussion going in the comment section. I mean, that's what it's there for, right? And since this is yet another part where I'm milling wood, this time for the privacy panels, which are just big panels, hence the name. So I figured I'd make this section a little more interesting by posing a question to get your thoughts about it. What do you think of my full plum shirt and pants combo? Is it too much? Or just the right amount of plum? Is it even plum at all? How cool do I look wearing a full plum outfit? Let me know what you think. I really am interested to know. Now, like I was saying a few minutes ago, I'm not sponsored by anyone, and I would never just use a tool because I'm getting paid. Sometimes it feels like people only do things because they can get paid, and that's just really sad. So if you see me using something in a video and getting paid or not, I'll let you know if I really like something. So I really want to let you know about a super useful tool, and that's my finger to spread glue. It's so easy to use and super convenient, and you have to give it a try. But you have to give your finger a try, not my finger. Just try spreading glue with your finger. What do you think of when you hear flat pack or knockdown furniture? If I had to take a guess, you're probably imagining a piece of furniture probably purchased online and shipped to you in a cardboard box, which then requires you to put it together with a tiny little wrench, which thank goodness was included with the purchase. But come on, this wrench, it's, it's tiny. And how am I supposed to tighten this bolt that's behind the leg? Why are there so many extra screws? I'm, you get the idea. We've all been there. I've owned my share of cheap furniture, but not all knockdown furniture has to be cheap and crappy. Sometimes it's knocked down for reasons beyond just fitting it into a cardboard box. This desk might have the most threaded inserts and bolts that I've ever put into a single piece of furniture, and it might be able to break down into more individual parts than any other piece of furniture I've ever made. And the reason for this is very simple. It's just so big, it would be impossible to move as a whole. So in order for us to move the desk, particularly into the office that it will be living in, we had to design ways for all the parts to attach and detach from each other. It basically broke down into seven individual parts. The two cabinets, the two privacy panels, the center leg, and the two halves of the top. And there would be connection points between all of these, which were all threaded inserts and bolts with washers. So with the center leg connections to the privacy panel and the cabinet connections to the legs done, the tricky part about all of this became temporarily assembling the desk to mark and drill the final connection between the back of the cabinets and the privacy panels. And while we were there, mark the far end of the privacy panels to be cut to match the angle of the cabinets. Is there a term for testing something unintentionally? Unintentional testing? Inadvertent testing? Whatever it's called, I then had to take it all back apart to actually install the threaded inserts and make those last cuts, then put it all back together again to make sure it was all fitting, hence the inadvertent testing. So at this point, I was very confident in the ability of the desk to be taken apart and put back together because of all of the testing.
Installing drawer fronts can be a pain, and I've used just about every technique over the years to try and get it right and do it in the easiest way, but this is the best way I have found to do it. Insert the screws that will attach the drawer front to the drawer box so they're just barely sticking through the front panel. Then insert the box into the cabinet and space the drawer front with shims in the cabinet opening. Then just push the drawer front against the drawer box so that the screws mark the back of the drawer front. And from there, I just drill small pilot holes, then attach the drawer front to the drawer box. And I'll start with the bottom drawer and just work my way up. Easy frickin' peasy. Okay, I don't wanna give it all away, but I do wanna just give a little teaser. A desk isn't really a desk without a desktop, of course. And Chris put together the desktop from a couple walnut slabs we got from GL Veneer. Go check them out, they have an insane inventory of slabs, and they also have this insane slab flipping machine, which I got to see in person when I picked up the slabs, and it was cool. But even better is that Chris made an entire video about the desktop over on the Four Eyes Furniture channel. So go check that out after you're done here. And you can also check out the last few years of videos that I've been making over there if you happen to have missed them. We hope you don't mind the multiple videos for this build. Oh look, there I am shooting this video. Well, not this exact video that you're seeing here. Chris shot this one, but the video you're watching, that's what I'm filming. Just not this exact video moment. Anyway, my guess is that if you've watched this far, you like this sort of content. So another video probably sounds pretty good. And I'm going to be getting videos back on this channel going forward. So again, if you've come this far and enjoyed it, subscribe for future videos. It really helps and I really appreciate it. And when you go watch Chris's video, subscribe to his channel too. Man, look at all this extra woodworking content to enjoy. Things are really starting to look up for all of us, aren't they? Hey, so sanding sucks, right? We can all agree on that? Okay, I was just checking. The only bummer is it has to be done. It just, it has to. And you can't scrimp on it. Skimp on it? Scrimp? Skimp? Are those different words or am I just getting confused? Okay, just Googled. They are different words and they mean basically the same thing. Bonus English lesson for the day, I guess. I think I was going somewhere with the sanding thing that I was just talking about, but uh, we got a little derailed. So either way, you can't skimp or scrimp on sanding. That's just how it is. Sand everything and sand it well. Because when it comes time to finish, you and your piece of furniture are gonna be so much happier. And that's kind of what it's all about, right? I make furniture, it makes me happy, and I make a video about it, which hopefully makes you happy, and we can all float around in this big happiness cloud. And I wanna to try to offer as much happiness as I can in whatever forms I can. So if you'll excuse one more shameless self-sponsored plug, go check out my Patreon page if you're interested. I've totally revamped it, and I'm gonna be putting extra content on there, which hopefully makes people happy. We have plenty of room in the happiness cloud after all. And the first thing that I'm gonna put up there is gonna be kind of a director's commentary of this video where I get into all the details and nitty gritty specifics of what I'm doing that I don't really have time for here and that stuff maybe gets a little boring for people I'm trying to keep these videos fun to watch after all. So if you're interested in all that, all of the hardcore woodworking details, or if you're just interested in supporting the channel, go check it out. And of course, if not, no worries. You can always just enjoy what I'm offering here, which is great. I'll be honest, it feels good to be posting videos on my old channel again. Hopefully there are still some people out there watching, but it's scary to make this sort of change. Chris and I had, and still have, a really good thing going, and we put a lot of work into getting it where it's at now, but sometimes life takes you in new directions and you have to adapt and change and just make the best of it. And the best part about it is that we're still doing what we've always been doing, making furniture, making furniture plans, making videos, having fun, and trying to never skimp 
or scrimp on any of it. And I know change can be hard, but obviously there are some old habits that are hard to break. So thank you again for watching. I really hope you had a good time and always remember to end your videos with the really terrible rhyme.